Hello all, welcome to lecture three. Dr. JC here, your third of four lectures here in lesson one. We're going to take a peek at ancient India and ancient China in this lecture and spend a little bit of time talking about uh, in India's uh, religions of salvation and China's philosophies of order. So we'll move to India first. Now regarding ancient India, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the climate of the Indian subcontinent, how that's impacted ancient civilizations, and in some sense, sort of modern life and livelihood there. We'll talk briefly about Aryan and Mauryan civilizations, those that will emerge predating European contact, whether it be Portuguese or English and talk briefly about these religions of salvation, specifically one in particular. Much like ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt, India too will be considered a river valley civilization, whether Aryan or later Mauryan, whether it's settlement along the Ganges or the Indus rivers, the rivers within the Indian subcontinent, this sort of triangular shaped continent, a big swath of land, will help shape Indian society and Indian civilization. While ancient India and initial settlement, especially along the Indus River, can be associated with Harappan society, I wanted to sort of bypass Harappan society. If you're interested in that, you can Google it. But I wanted to focus more specifically and briefly on Aryan and Mauryan India. Now, the Aryans are believed to have invaded Harappan India from Caucasia, or that area roughly between the Black and Caspian Seas. And with them, they will bring importantly the caste system. Now the caste system was a way to divide society by one's caste or class and whatever caste you were born into that's where you stayed so there wasn't any social mobility per se it's not like you could be born a warrior in the Kshatriya class and somehow move your way up through good deeds or words or actions into the Brahmin class. It didn't work that way. You were born to a caste you stayed in that caste. Now just because one couldn't move up in class per se doesn't mean that this is a debilitating or backward system. It isn't. It's just the way that ancient Aryans and later Mauryans and to some extent of the present day Indians separate their classes based on caste. If you're interested in the individual castes so the system itself I'd ask that you research it a little bit more at length. Again we're limited from time here and space. With that, though, I would make one mention that when we get ready to talk about Buddhism and Siddhartha Gautama, I wanted to make mention of the Kshatriya class or warrior class because he'll be part of that class. Keep that in mind. Just as I would like you to remember that the Aryans brought the caste system to India, I also want you to think of Indian unification, the bringing together of lots of different peoples across the Indian subcontinent under the leadership of Chandra Gupta Maurya, hence the name Mauryan India. One of the ways Chandra Gupta Maurya was able to bring together disparate peoples to get them to think of themselves as something larger, something new, as Indians, was through the network of roads. A less appreciated aspect of systems of transportation, perhaps, is the unifying effect it can have on a country or an empire. Chandragupta recognized this and that was part of his idea of constructing this thousand mile highway linking all parts of his empire. Look, it wasn't just to expedite trade or have his ability to move his troops around more expeditiously. Clearly those were two key components of that. But he wanted people to be able to move through different regions of the empire so that they recognized they had more in common with one another than age-old stereotypes suggested otherwise. Hence the unifying nature of these systems of transportation. Before moving into India's religions of salvation, I wanted to reiterate a couple key points. With Aryan civilization, I want you to think of bringing about the caste system. And with Mauryan India, I want you to think of the unification of India. Regarding the religions of salvation of India, we could easily spend 16 weeks here alone, whether it's talking about the various religions of salvation, key concepts of the various faiths, such as the samsara or transmigration of the soul, karma, the net balance between good and bad in one's previous life and how that impacts the start point of one's next life. Ahimsa, this principle of absolute nonviolence and why that's important. 
or even Nirvana, not the Kurt Cobain stuff either. I'm talking about the Nirvana here, which has to deal with ultimate reality, where one is in unison with the Oversoul or the World Soul. It is like Enlightenment times ten. Or even the importance of influential spiritual texts of these various religions of salvation, whether they be the Upanishads or the Bhagavad Gita. We simply don't have the time to go through each of these. Rather, I want to focus specifically on Buddhism. I've decided to focus on Buddhism because it's likely the most recognizable of the Indian religions of salvation to all of us. And I think it has some ties to other faiths too, like Zoroastrianism that we've talked about previously. Now, the faith itself gets the start from this cat right here, Sudarta Gautama. This is the Buddha himself. He was born into the Kshatriya class, so he's born into a warrior caste. This is on the upper end of the social scale, so to speak. And he begins to question life in general. Most specifically, he looks about all the different castes and recognizes that it doesn't matter if you are in an untouchable at the bottom end of the social scale, or you're in his Kshatriya class as a warrior, or even higher in his Brahmin class, there is suffering across all the spectrums. And what he doesn't understand and wants to kind of, kind of try to tease out is, where does this suffering come from? If I'm from the upper class, maybe I shouldn't have to suffer as much from somebody in the lower class. And so this question of suffering leads him on this journey. So the Buddha begins to travel about the countryside, and he begins to meditate and move inside of himself. And he discovers that there are these four noble truths that he comes up with. And he places together a sort of, I don't know, self-help map in a way called this Eightfold Path. And we'll talk about the Four Noble Truths right here first. Number one, he says, look, ordinary life's full of suffering. Just is. So if life is full of suffering, where does it come from? He determines that it, it's caused by our own desire to satisfy ourselves. Therefore, if we can end our own desires, therefore, theoretically, we can end suffering. And he says, well, how do we go about ending desire? And this is where he comes up with this eightfold or middle path. This eightfold or middle path you can see on this slide here starts with one, right view, two, right intention, three, right speech, and then right around clockwise, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right contemplation. Get yourself right, he says. Make yourself perfect, he says. And that's how you can avoid suffering because you can achieve personal self-perfection. That's how you achieve nirvana. That's how you come into contact and concert with that great oversoul of the world. This is how you alleviate suffering. Not worrying about what your neighbor's doing. Figure out getting yourself right first. Buddhism, therefore, in some sense, is really more of a philosophy, per se, than it is religion. But what's interesting about it in this regard is that it does move beyond caste. It doesn't matter what caste you are in, you can become perfect as an untouchable, you can become perfect as a Kshatriya, you can become perfect as a Brahmin. Everybody needs to get themselves right and if everyone gets themselves right, society by extension should be fine too. What's interesting if you think about this Eightfold Path, mirror that with the right words, right deeds, right intentions of Faravahar or Zoroastrianism. You see the same sorts of concepts. It doesn't matter if it's in ancient Persia or here in India and by extension China as well. A lot of the same sort of concepts and underpinning sort of spiritualities and philosophies. Something to think about. Buddhism, one of those religions of salvation in India, provides a nice segue into China's philosophies of order. We're going to talk about three of those philosophies of order next. Those philosophies of order are Confucianism, Taoism slash Taoism, and Legalism. We'll start here with Confucianism. Confucius, or Kung Fuzi, sometimes referred to as Master Kong as well, was something of a polymath, a little bit of an editor, philosopher, politician, and teacher. What we might call a slash on the football field. This is a cat that's going to play in a lot of different positions. Now, his writings and teachings were captured in the Analects, this book of instruction, as it were. And according to Confucius, the best way to create order in society 
was by strengthening society. It's worth noting that China had gone through several hundred years of constant warfare, this period of warring states as it was called. And people like Confucius were looking for ways to create order in society without killing one another. Hence his ideas here as it relates to Confucianism. Now he thought if we could train some master teachers and mentors, they could go on and train individuals who could go out then and petition government, be active, call for change, and this ultimately would strengthen society. Others like Lao Tzu would come behind Confucius and say, well, I get what you're saying about strengthening society, but if you're going to create order, bro, you need to strengthen the individual, not society, because the individual precedes society. Therefore, with Lao Tzu, we see the creation of Taoism or Taoism. Lao Tzu's basic philosophy of Taoism, Taoism differed here from Confucian largely because of the way he saw society. Confucius didn't necessarily trust the average everyday individual. Lao Tzu did. He said, look, most people are hardware to be pretty good, right? If there's an amber alert, people don't ask what color the kid is or what sex the kid is. They just start looking for license plates they want to help, right? So what Lao Tzu believes is that, look, if government gets in the way, that's when we create problems. When you start to impact individuals' lives and liberty, that's when people get upset. So the best way to do that is to leave people alone. Let them be good. Let them create and innovate and help one another. Thus for Lao Tzu, if you want to create order in society, you do that by strengthening individuals. And you strengthen the individual by getting bureaucrats, government, red tape out of the way. Let people live their lives. That's what he believed. So according to Confucius, then, we strengthen society, and that creates order. Lao Tzu says, no, not so fast, my friend. We strengthen the individual. That creates order. Enter Shang Yang, who says, all y'all are smoking some happy stuff. The best way to create order is strengthen the state, period. In his book of Shang, Shang Yang does posit this notion of a strong state and this sense of legalism. Legalism to Shang Yang is a strong leader, a strong emperor, a strengthened bureaucratic structure that will impose rule and drive people. Sorry, Confucius, says Shang Yang, but having mentors, what good is that going to do? Who's controlling the message? You might have several different mentors saying several different things. We want one message, one message alone, and that is to strengthen the state. Sorry, Lao Zi, says Shang Yang. We don't have peoples who are citizens. We have subjects who will be driven. So your philosophy, Lao Zi, is Lao Zi. Yes, it is. It stinks. The best way to have a strong ordered society is to have a strong monarch, a strong bureaucratic structure, and a strong state. Period. What we have at the end of all this is three varying and vying philosophies of order. Ultimately, it's going to be Shang Yang's legalism that wins out. He's going to help promote a strong leader in the name of Qin Shi Huangdi. This individual will create the Qin Dynasty, and the Qin Dynasty then will start what's known as Imperial China. Imperial China is a period of history that's going to run from roughly about 220 BC all the way till 1912. Yes, 1912 most recently. So China will be structured on this legalist principle according to the book of Shang from roughly 220 to 1912. While always a difficult task trying to cover as much ground as we can in roughly 15 minutes, I hope through this discussion of the religions of salvation in India and the philosophies of order in China that have maybe piqued some interest for you that you'll do some further research or digging on your own. Dr. JC out from lecture three here. We move on to Greece next, lecture four. So we'll head to Greece next.